joined by delighted Foreign Office Minister James <laughs> Cleverly. My goodness me, good day at the office. Yeah, a good day, a good day. And look, it's the culmination of a lot of work. I mean, people have been working on this for, for years, uh, previous foreign secretaries, previous officials. Uh, but, yeah, <laughs> yesterday was a really good day, a really good yeah. day. You've been intimately involved in the negotiations for a very long time uh, in, in, with, the, with your uh, respective job. What have been the most challenging aspects? Well, you know, for, for much of this, we, we, we found dealing with the Iranian government uh, incredibly difficult. I think the change of government has definitely helped. Um, the practicalities of the uh, of the logistics of getting people home, the negotiations of getting Nazneen out on furlough. I mean, it was complicated at every stage. Of course, because of the uh, huge number of sanctions, quite rightly applied to Iran, all these things become very, very tricky, very, very difficult. Uh, but ultimately, we you know we never gave up. We continued working. We continued supporting the families. And I have to say. My admiration for, for the families of all those uh, detained in Iran is, is, is enormous. And because of that continued teamwork, we, we managed to secure the release of, um, of, of three day t detainees and obviously Nazneen and Anoushe get to come home as well. Mm. Why did we not pay our debt 20 years ago, as we were instructed to do by the International Court of Arbitration? Well, one of the big problems, of course, is because of Iran's behaviour, because of, they, because of things they have chosen to do, there are a huge number of international sanctions against them and UK sanctions. So it is technically not easy. Now, we were able to come to an arrangement, uh, the details of which I'm not allowed to discuss, they're confidential, whereby we can ensure that the uh, money is for humanitarian purposes only and that we've been able to do a deal which does fit within the international sanctions regime that's imposed against Iran. Yeah, but I suppose the question remains, why did we not pay the debt before now? Given that we can pay it now and the sanctions are still in place, why didn't we pay it sooner? Well, uh, as I say, I can't go into the details of the agreement, but obviously there are always two parties, to, uh, well, at least two parties to a negotiation. Uh, the previous Iranian regime proved very, very difficult to uh, deal with, and some of the proposals that we had put forward uh, in the past weren't accepted. Um, the new government coming in did give us an opportunity to reset. The foreign secretary had the first face-to-face -face meetings with her opposite number in Iran for the first time in over three years. I had a face-to-face -face meeting with my opposite number in Iran, again, first time for many, many years. And I think that was part of a combination of things which enabled us to, to settle this. So is it right to say, without going into any detail, that we had been trying to pay the debt for some time, but we'd come oh, up against roadblocks? We had been looking at ways to settle the debt that we conceded that we owed. We, we, we owed this debt, we accepted that debt. Obviously, the sanctions position made it incredibly difficult. You, could, you cannot just write a cheque. It doesn't work like that. Mm. Now, the details of how we have done it, of course, as I say, have to remain confidential. Uh, but it's taken a huge amount of work to come up with a method of ensuring that money is for humanitarian purposes and that it conforms to the sanctions uh, That regime. was my next question. How do we make sure that they don't use it for arms? Well, uh, as I say, the, the, the precise details of, of how we do this, I'm not allowed to uh, discuss. But, OK, let me ask you a different way. How confident are you that they will not be allowed to use it for arms? So we have taken uh, every precaution to make sure that this is used exclusively for humanitarian um, uh, requirements. Iran does have a significant and meaningful humanitarian requirement. Um, and, uh, and as I say, we have taken precautions to, to ensure that. And how do we make sure that uh, uh, future Brits have not put themselves in a more challenging position because some would say this is, can be seen as a, a, as a ransom payment? Well, look, we've always said these things uh, were negotiated in parallel, but they were themselves separate. We owed this money. It was money that, the, I as you say, that, that we owed. Um, so, so that was one uh, set of negotiations about how we... Uh, how we did that. But we have always said the arrest and incarceration of all those British dual nationals was unfair, it was wrong, it was completely unjustified. We've negotiated very hard for many, many years to get them home. We always tell people to uh, pay close attention to the UK travel advice. I think dual nationals are po 
particularly vulnerable in Iran because Iran does not recognise dual nationality. Um, but we will keep working to secure the permanent release and return home of all those unfairly detained. Yeah, but the release and the payment both came on the same day. So, you know, it, it's not such a great leap to think that, you know, it was a ransom payment. Well, as I say, we have always made it clear that the money was owed. We recognise that. We've been looking at ways of doing that. What connections the Iranian regime make is up to them. We have always been completely clear that the incarceration of British dual nationals was completely wrong, completely arbitrary, completely unfair, and it has always been in Iran's gift to uh, release them. The charges against them were trumped up. We've always said this to be the case. Um, look, but we're just really, really clear. You see the images. Yeah, no, of course, of, but it's purely coincidental that those two things happened well, no, on look, the same day. Look, as, I've, as I've said, we have always made it clear that, that it is not linked, but uh, the, Iranians, um, the Iranians make the decisions that they make uh, uh, in response to the bilateral relationship. Settling this debt, uh, the negotiations we've had with this new uh, Iranian government have clearly been more fruitful. And I, for one, am just you know, incredibly pleased that we're able to help families reunite. OK, and it, was it medical supplies? How did we...? As I say, there's, there's, there's confidentiality. OK, um, Morad, we were expecting Morad to be on the plane as well. Certainly that was the impression we were given yesterday by the Foreign Secretary. What's happened there? Well, no, we were, we were uh, always trying to secure, as I say, the full and permanent release of all the British dual nationals, trying to get them all home. Uh, as the Foreign Secretary said in the House of Commons yesterday, uh, Morad is a tri-national. He's got uh, American citizenship as well. That has made it, in the eyes of the Iranians, uh, more complicated, and they are obviously uh, seeking to uh, speak with the Americans about him as well. We have and we will continue to do everything we can to get him home as well, You're to confident. his family. You're confident he'll be coming home? Well, look, it's always very well, tricky. He's the I mean, only one that, been... of the three that is the only one that was actually born in Britain. I know, he was born in Hammersmith. Uh, I've spoken, I've spoken with, uh, I've spoken with his, uh, his family on a number of occasions. Um, we are going to keep working to get him home, to get him properly okay. and fully released. Well, let's hope that is uh, before too long. Uh, let's talk about Saudi Arabia. Um, has there been any sort of breakthrough with the Prime Minister and uh, the Saudis? Well, look, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister is looking to help alleviate the pressure that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has had on oil and gas prices. Uh, we'll have to see what the production levels that come out of the uh, Middle East. Uh, the, you know, the Prime Minister has um, you know, a very influential relationship with a number of heads of state and heads of government uh, in the Middle East, and I really hope that... Um, that that production will step up to alleviate some of the pressure that we're seeing. But ultimately, the Prime Minister is right. The best way to protect ourselves against this kind of pressure in the future is to make sure we diversify our energy production, we move to renewable energy so we become less reliant on all oil and gas, particularly oil and gas coming out of Russia. 81 people killed on a single day uh, over the weekend in Saudi Arabia. Three more um, killed uh, yesterday. We were told that the Prime Minister brought up human rights abuses when he was speaking to the Saudis. It used to be um, a region that you were particularly uh, involved with, Middle East Minister, of course. What particular human rights abuses would you have wanted the Prime Minister to bring up with the Saudis? Well, the UK has a long-standing and in-principle opposition to the death penalty. We bring that up when we speak with any country that has the uh, death penalty. That would have been brought up by the Prime Minister? It would have been brought up with the, the Prime Minister. I brought it up when I was the minister responsible for our relationship uh, with the Middle East. I brought it up with those countries in the Middle East that retain the death penalty. Um, and we do bring up uh, human rights more generally. We defend human rights defenders uh, in the Middle East, including in Saudi Arabia. And we, we do have regularly very frank conversations with them uh, about this. Uh, we do, of course, need to uh, maintain a uh, strong working relationship with Saudi. It is a very significant and influential country in the region and in the Islamic world. But we do not hold back when we have conversations uh, with the Saudis and others about these issues. What do we say to them about the way they treat women? Well, we, we have been um, uh, critical about uh, the, the role of women in Saudi society. I'm pleased to say, actually, that over the last few years there has been a huge liberalisation in the uh, lives of women in Saudi Arabia. I've seen the change uh, over the years that I've been visiting. We encourage them to keep that going. Women, you know, are, are now... Gonna, I have to interrupt you there, Minister, if I may, because I did see a video the other day of a... And, and, you know, I couldn't t tweet it because it was just disgusting. A woman who had allegedly uh, committed adultery, um, officials chopped her head off as she was walking across the zebra crossing with her child. I haven't seen that. I can't comment on that without no, saying No, but... It, 
trust me, it illustrates how women, some women can be treated. Uh, as I say, I'm very, very uncomfortable. I'm very uncomfortable passing comment on a video that I, I haven't seen, I don't know the provenance of. Um, the simple fact is that the, as I say, the, the, the liberalisation of the role of women in Saudi has been pacey. We look to um, uh, amplify that. We want that to, um, to continue. I've spoken and I've had dealings with uh, senior uh, women officials in the Saudi system. That wouldn't have been the case a number of years ago. Um, we are, we are, as I say, we are always going to bring up human rights issues when we speak. OK, the South. final thought about, uh, talking about human rights, final thought uh, with Ukraine before I let you go. Um, it looks as though hundreds of people uh, were sheltering in a theatre so... and um, direct hit, uh, bombed. It looks as though they were targeted. That sounds to me like another war crime. Well, look, we have, we have seen obvious targeting of civilian infrastructure. That's against international humanitarian law. It's against the law of armed conflict. Uh, we've got to make sure that we capture evidence of uh, all these uh, incidents so that, uh, so that the, the, the Russian regime that's conducting this completely illegal, completely unjustified war in Ukraine are held accountable by the international courts once this, is, uh, once this is resolved. And we will keep applying pressure to choke off the funding to the Russian war machine to try and bring this war to a conclusion as quickly as possible.